After an afternoon spent with their father in downtown Cortland, Ohio, shopping for red licorice at Cupid's Treats, and after lunch at the Ping Ping Palace, Lily and Junebug dozed amid the flowers and grasses of a low green hill. Their house is just visible far and away in the distance. Mud Pup the dog barks and chases a butterfly. They didn't know the names of the flowers in which they lay. Pollen dusty daisies, wild violets, coin flowers. So Junebug named them herself, touching a finger to the soft center of each. Carnation, lily, and lily, she said again, touching the cinnamon freckled nose of her little sister Lily. And rose, she said, plucking a quite unrose-like stem of Queen Anne's lace from which a fat bumblebee lazily arose. Lily and Junebug discuss the chubby gray clouds that move across the azure sky. One looks like a teapot. One looks like a crazy sneaker, its toe curling and uncurling. One looks like Junebug and Lily's Aunt Vera. Look, yells Lily, it's Aunt Vera. Oh, how I'd love to be in her stinkberry patch, smelling the yummy smells, the icky bugs biting my arms. Aunt Vera making marshmallow ambrosia, the charcoal bricks giving me black fingers. Miss Vera's life was a long series of magical stories, like shiny dull pearls on a long, long necklace. She would drink out of a special clear glass on a long stem with an upside-down pyramid at the top and tell stories about New York City. New York City had places with gleaming names like the Rainbow Room, Pearly Palace, or the Tiki Hut. Her voice got all sweet and sugary, and she would tell of ladies in shiny green dresses who sang under a single spotlight, and the song was so sad and true that everyone, even the fat man with the goatee who played the drums, would squeeze out a single big tear. She would tell about the billion winking, shining, blinking, bright bulbs of a street called Broadway. A broken heart for every light, she said and sighed, rearranging her pink-flowered bathrobe. They pretended they were angels on an air gust and spread their gossamer wings and flew over the tiny downtown of Cortland and all the way to New York City, where they saw men in the park serving sausages from a green and white striped cart and fat girls with pet monkeys on leashes and stores with diamonds as big as Oreo cookies. Listen, said Lily, and they heard arguing and stories and all kinds of music, jangle, tingle, and sweet saxophone, and boom, boom, and clink, clink, and pretty little melodies played on baby grand pianos by men in black tuxedos, and the hiss of steam coming from deep underground, and they landed, and the ground moved beneath their feet, and that was the subway. Lily and Junebug liked to go to Aunt Vera's very much and sometimes spent the night sleeping in her large wooden bed. Her bed had a towering headboard and tall, big footboard, both of which were carved with twining fruits and gentle, sad-faced angels. 
A cloud of tulle cascaded from each corner of the canopy. Aunt Vera had been married three times, each time to a man named Bob. Bob number one was a tall man with wavy brown hair who sang in the lizard lounge downtown. Bob number two owned an ice cream parlor called Cupid's Treats. He used to make towering strawberry cones with an animal cracker stuck on top for Lily and Junebug. Bob number three had a small blue car that he was always washing with a hose in the driveway. Bob number two sent twelve roses of the palest pink to Aunt Vera on her birthday, no matter what. He called on the telephone sometimes, and Aunt Vera would laugh and roll her eyes at the jokes he made. He still loved Aunt Vera, and made her little carvings out of bars of soap and left them in her mailbox. Or sometimes he decorated her car with flowers. He lived on the edge of town, in a small yellow house with his dog, Peanut. There were pictures of young women dressed in yellow chicken feathers and decorated with seashells. One was of Aunt Vera herself in a mirrored bar, her head thrown back, laughing, her lipsticky lips smiling as a man in a dark suit leaned forward to light her cigarette. Her pretty, pretty face and her short, curly bob were reflected a dozen times, back, back, like a girl in a cereal box who holds a cereal box with herself holding a cereal box, and on that box is herself again holding a cereal box. There was a blue music box made of tin, and when they lifted the lid, cranky, wheezy music played. Vera said, A music box is the most romantic gift a girl can receive. She opened a small cupboard under the stairs, and in that cupboard was a box, and in that box were 37 music boxes.
In the wardrobe were what seemed like hundreds of dresses, silky, svelte, trimmed with fur or decorated with hundreds of tiny pearls, buttons like big diamonds or blue glass, a fox who clasped its own tail in its mouth and of which Lily was very afraid, hat boxes filled with dusty hats covered in twining leaves with grape clusters, slinky nets on black hats that covered one eye, shoes with crystal clear heels or toes which curled up at the ends and were made of orange and purple rhinestones. Glamour, Aunt Vera said. Glamour, Lily and Junebug said, and ran pink or red lipstick all over their mouths. educated person. I'm a magazine reader. Thank you. 